lived to cure cancer. I wasn't born that way. I didn't know that when I was 15 or when I was 20. Everybody here must know someone who has cancer. It's kind of the disease of our time. And 10 years ago, I watched my sister-in-law, Monica, slowly die of breast cancer. And I was very affected by this. Ultimately, she died of the tumor spreading to her brain. And I know the last Christmas time that I saw her that that would probably be the last time. And worse than the diagnosis she received eight years earlier, in which she learned that there were cancer cells in her breast that were dividing uncontrollably, that her body couldn't repress, and that these cells were spreading and taking over her body cell by cell. Worse than that were the side effects of the treatments that she endured to battle the cancer. The side effects are what I call collateral damage in her war against cancer. First, there was a surgery, radical surgery, multiple surgeries. And she told me one day, Karen, she said, my chest looks like a battleground, a war zone. You wouldn't believe it. And there was pain, and it wasn't just physical pain. It was emotional, it was psychological. She said, I'm too young. I have a child, I have children, my brothers, who she married, my husband. And then there's the chemo and radiation. Well, chemo and radiation kill dividing cells. Well, that's good because tumor cells are dividing uncontrollably. But the chemo and the radiation does not distinguish between your healthy cells that are dividing quickly and the cancer cells. Its job is to kill anything that's dividing quickly. So comes radiation and chemo, and she lost her hair because your hair cells are dividing. And when she lost her hair, she lost some of her self-esteem and her self-image. And I remember how devastating this was for her. And then there's the nausea, the fatigue, trouble with your skin. Your skin cells are dividing, your blood cells, your gut. It affects every part of your body, and little by little, your life gets taken away. Now, she died at age 49. Her mother had died at age 31. So are we making progress in our battle against cancer? Yes, we are. But is it enough? No, it's not. And there are many challenges to face and barriers to overcome in the pursuit of this goal, which I'm still learning. I'm privileged to be a scientist in 2012. What is science? The state of knowing. Knowledge is distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding. Louis Pasteur, in this quote, shows that science has no boundaries. Science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and is the torch which illuminates the world. In, in essence, it's the pursuit of truth. What's true? What's not? So on my research into brain tumors. Now, a bit of serendipity, uh, I was still junior in the lab, and when stem cells at the time, nobody knew what they were or really talked much about them. This is about 18 years ago. Stem cells came to the lab, and the person who should have taken them and used them and grown them was on vacation. So I said, well, Dr. Brakefield, can I do it? Can I take them? I'm curious. I want to see. And she said, OK. Little did I know that was going to be my career for the next 18 years. Stem cell research. You've all heard a lot about it politically, ethically, morally. What's the big deal? Why is everyone so excited? And this is from David Baltimore, Don't Impede Medical Progress. And he said about stem cells, once in a long while, medical science comes up with a wholly new way to attack disease. The discovery of growing human cells in the laboratory has provided science with a tool whereby new cells, tissues, organs may replace diseased ones. No other technology offers such an opportunity for medical research. It's exciting. It's something that can revolutionize all of medicine. So what are stem cells? When you're first formed with the egg and the sperm and you have those two cells, those two cells know how to become every cell in their body. It's, it's amazing. They have the DNA. They have the instructions. 
And those stem cells can become your skin, your brain, your heart, your muscle, your blood. They know how to do that. They know where to go. They know when to divide. And unlike cancer cells, they know when to stop dividing. What could, if we can learn this, we, we're, we're way ahead of the game. As scientists, now that we can grow these cells in the lab, can we guide them? Can we make them new skin for burn victims who need skin? Can we make them heart tissue for patients who've had a heart attack and lost part of their heart muscle? Can we put them in the brain of a stroke patient and have them regenerate new brain? Those are the secrets we're trying to unlock. There are stem cell therapies now currently in clinical trials in the past five years. They're used now at UCLA for cell replacement. They are taking stem cells, turning in them into retinal cells in the dish, and then putting them into patients with macular degeneration who are going blind. And these cells, can they replace those cells and actually restore vision? Remyelination, spinal cord injury patients. Parkinson's, ALS, stroke. These cells have the ability to stay in these damaged areas and make signals that will regenerate the tissue. Enzyme replacement. Now, what we discovered back in 18 years ago in Dr. Sandra Brakefield's lab, cancer is a type of injury. It is a pathology. And the stem cells know by themselves how to go to points of pathology. Would they? Would they go to stem cells? They migrate. Can they find these invasive tumor cells that are damaging the body? Cancer. In the book, The Emperor of All Maladies, it's called the epidemic of our times. We're living longer. More and more people are getting cancer. 600,000 Americans in 2010, 7 million worldwide cancer fatalities. Brain cancer alone, $3.9 billion in U.S. medical expenses in 2010. High-grade glioma, pediatric tumors. And now, because we're getting better at treating metastatic cancer, more and more patients with, with melanoma, breast cancer, lung cancer, are presenting with metastasis to the brain. Why? Because they're treating the cancer outside the brain, but these drugs don't cross over to the brain. So more and more patients are dying from their brain metastasis. How do we treat cancer today? Surgery, if it's local, we can cut it out. Radiation and chemo, as I told you, will kill dividing cells. But there are lots of side effects. But brain tumors, and this is a glioma, one of the worst tumors, you can't cut it all out. It's so invasive, there's, there's no edge. It's not like a golf ball. You can't take it out. Whatever you take out, there are more cells left. The blood-brain barrier blocks 98% of the chemo drugs we have on the market. They won't get there. And the few that do don't penetrate the tumor. Plus, you have toxicity to normal tissues. It's not like um, the liver. If you have cancer of the liver, there's still parts of the liver functioning. The brain, every cell counts, and the damages are devastating. It's incurable and lethal with current cancer therapies. Now, what we discovered was that stem cells track down tumor cells. The surgeon can remove the main tumor mass, but, but they're going to miss tumors that have infiltrated into the, the normal tissue. And there you see one tumor cell moving away into the normal tissue, and the stem cell, which is blue, virtually piggybacking it. I didn't do anything to those stem cells. They know how to do that. That's what they do. And over the years, we found that even if you put them on the opposite side of the brain, they'll cross over to the tumor. If there's multiple tumors in the brain, they'll localize to all those spots. So they're overcoming the major treatment obstacles that are now preventing us from treating brain tumors well. Now, stem cells can localize to cancer sites also in the lung, liver, and ovary. This is the work we're doing now. Can we inject them IV and hit metastatic cancer sites? And if we do, can we localize the chemotherapy just to the tumor and leave the rest of the body alone? Just an interesting point. When we look at 10 different breast cancer lines, what it turns out is the more aggressive the cancer, the more the stem cells go to it. So there's something in common with these very aggressive, invasive cancers that are drawing the tumors there. So used as a delivery vehicle, 
these stem cells can be modified to target different agents to these tumor cells, many different agents. And the cancer wants to survive no matter what. So whatever you throw at it, some will mutate and avoid it. So we're talking of needing combination therapies. Now what we've taken to the clinic now is we grow our stem cells, they make an enzyme, doesn't do anything. Then we put them into the patient, they find the tumor cells. Now we treat with an inactive prodrug, and when it sees the CD the stem cells are making, it converts to a chemotherapeutic at the tumor site, diffusing out, killing the tumor cells that are dividing. You stop giving the prodrug, you stop making the chemo. So in effect, we have localized chemotherapy, minimal toxicity to normal tissues, and decreased side effects and improved quality of life. This video says that in about 45 seconds. A surgeon can remove the main tumor mass, but individual tumor cells may have already spread to normal brain tissue. Relapse almost always occurs, usually resulting in death. With Dr. Abudi's research, neural stem cells are modified with genes that express therapeutic enzymes. When these modified cells are injected into the patient, they migrate through tissue and seek out the tumor sites. Then a prodrug, a benign form of a drug, is injected into the vein of the patient. When it reaches the brain and encounters the enzyme produced by the modified neural stem cells, it is converted into a chemotherapeutic agent that fights the tumor. In effect, it achieves localized chemotherapy production, specifically at the tumor sites. That is the hope. We are in first in human clinical trials at City of Hope first in human use of a stem cell line for cancer, first in use in human to deliver a therapeutic agent. The hero of this study is Jenny, who was the first patient that volunteered to start this new trial. She was in hospice, had two months left to live, and she wanted her life to mean something, and she knew that this wasn't going to help her. The first patient, it's low dose, it's a safety study, but she wanted to make a difference for everyone who came after her. And my fear is the night of the sur before the surgery is what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't work? What if it does harm? What if it doesn't cure her tumor? And, and what if this whole strategy doesn't work in patients? And I stayed up that night and my now husband said to me, he held my hand and he said, you know, eventually you gotta, you gotta kinda take the risk. You gotta make the decision to put the money on the table, make the bet, and play your hand, because otherwise you will never know if this works or not. And we moved forward. Phase one are safety studies. Phase two are investigational efficacy studies. Phase three, you need to uh, make, uh, commercialize a product. 13 to 15 years from lab to clinical product, 1.2 billion dollars approximate cost and if failures added in two billion dollars only nine percent get approved for the first phase and if those 70 percent probability of success 15 percent will go to phase two trials and then 66 percent of those will fail you have to be able to stick it out there's a lot that doesn't work we must accept failure and risk-taking as a necessary part of medical research Paul Ehrlich at the turn of the 19th century was looking at syphilis and he made a drug and treated 50 patients and their dementia went away and they got better. And then he treated thousands of patients and then toxicity reports came in. People were doing badly, people were dying after they were made improvement. And instead of being deterred where all his colleagues were accusing him of very terrible things, he went back to the lab to find out why this was happening. And three years later, and 300 derivatives later, he came out with a compound that treated syphilis safe, safely and effectively. This was before penicillin. But he didn't give up. In moving the treatment from the laboratory to the patients, there are many, many obstacles, and money is one of them. Things die in the lab because it's called the valley of death translational research. We can cure lots of things in the lab, but if we don't have the money to get it into the patients, it's no good. And then there's another valley of death, to get it to commercial product. These cost millions of dollars. If industry doesn't step in and develop it, it dies in phase two. So we need to overcome these barriers.
and how do we meet these challenges? Persistence, resilience, and drive. We look for grant money from the government, private foundations, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, you voted $3 billion for stem cell research. We have $18 million to make the second generation drug. Institutional support. City of Hope, when I first got there, they said, what's your vision and what do you need? No one ever said that to me before. They have supported me in this trial. The clinicians are there, the patients, the regulatory affairs, and we made it into clinical trials. And never underestimate philanthropy and donors. It's the donors and philanthropy that got me to this point so far. They believed in me, they believed in trying something new, and they supported the trial. Finally, I want to leave you with, with my solution in entrepreneurship and risk-taking and partnerships. The world's too complicated. These diseases are too complicated. They cost too much money. We need to partner industry, academics, philanthropy, and government together to work together to get these new therapies to the patients. I founded Therabiologics in June, and it's committed to developing the clinical development of this stem cell needed therapy. And if not mine and someone can better it, all the better. But we want to make sure there's money for the clinical trials to continue. Finally, I want to leave you that it starts with an idea, and you have to share that idea, or it goes away. You have a conversation with someone. They like the idea. We talk about it. We have a mutual interest. A collaboration gets formed. We put a dedicated team together, and then we make a difference as a team. Follow your inspiration. Carpe diem. Seize the day. Seize the moment before it leaves. There's a lot we can do together to make a difference. Thank you.